Alison Tandry here once again with another lecture in my series on Trom theory. Today I'll be quoting from, commenting on, summarizing, paraphrasing and clarifying key passages from the very first chapter of Trom 2023, the new and improved version of Dennis Stevens' original work entitled The Resolution of Mind, a Games Manual. So even if, after the work we've put into making that book easier to read you're still having problems with it, have no worries. By the end of my talk you should be able to read the first chapter with ease. No previous study is required to listen to this presentation. In the original book, The Resolution of Mind a Games Manual by Dennis Stevens, he wrote that life is a spiritual quality. It has four basic abilities. It can bring things into existence. It can take things out of existence. It can know. It cannot know. These actions are accomplished by postulates. A postulate is a causative consideration. When you postulate something, you intend it to come about. You want to cause something to happen. That which is brought into existence, taken out of existence, known or not known, is called an effect. The purpose of bringing an effect into existence is to make it known. The purpose of taking an effect out of existence is to make it not known. And you can know an effect, or you cannot know an effect. When an effect is made known and you know it, or it's taken out of existence and you then not know it, the postulates the other is making as well as your own are in agreement. These we call complementary postulates. But if an effect is brought into existence and you try and not know it, or taken out of existence and you postulate to know it, those are conflicting postulates. This brings us to the subject of affinity. Affinity is the degree of love or liking. Complementary postulates increase affinity. Conflicting postulates lessen it. The four basic postulates of to know, to not know, to be known and to not be known each have a twin. When you postulate to know, you are at the same time postulating an effect to be known. When you postulate to not know an effect, you are also postulating that effect not be known. When you postulate to be known, you want another to know, and when you postulate not to be known, you are also postulating the other to not know. When you want to see someone, you want them to be seen. If you don't want to see them, then you don't want them to be seen. And it works the same way for wanting to be seen or not wanting to be seen. When you make a postulate, you are actually making two. Your statement of intent and what you intend for the effect. This is the difference between a self-determined and pan-determined postulate. The to-be-known postulate is the creative postulate, the postulate that brings the effect into existence. Even if one is creating something to be known only for himself, he is still making that pan-determined postulate on himself to know it. Now as I have mentioned in a previous lecture, complementary postulates can diminish or vanish a postulate. And because one wishes his effects to persist through time, which is a postulate to continue to be known, he will call his creation something it isn't. In other words, there will be a lie in it so that the actual postulated effect is not so easily vanished by a complementary postulate. Have you ever heard that once something is thoroughly understood, it vanishes? Well, similarly, if you want something to persist, make sure it's never completely understood or identified. The mechanism of the lie ensures that. And as a side note, when someone postulates to make an effect known and lies about it, he is also postulating, to a degree, that it not be known. He doesn't want it thoroughly understood or complemented, thus bringing about the vanishment. The to not be known postulate is the vanishing postulate, the postulate that takes the effect out of existence. The pan-determined postulate that complements it is not no. To truly vanish something you do need to make a complementary postulate with it. But what if you can't because it's covered in lies, like I talked about previously? If the being cannot vanish it, he has to be content with hiding it. The most common way a being does this is by putting up non-perception screens. He blocks it out. To know is the postulate that permits the being to know the effect. The pan-determined postulate that goes with it is to be known. 
Though the postulate itself does not involve putting up any non-perception screens, you still may encounter some blocking your way. So just be aware of this when you pursue this postulate. To not know an effect is to be unaware of it. Note the difference between wanting to be unaware of something versus wanting to take it out of existence. That's the difference between the not know and not be known postulate. It's necessary to clearly differentiate this postulate from be not known. Be not known is a vanishing or hiding postulate, not know is merely a desire not to perceive the effect. An example of the use of the postulate is a spiritual being looking through a wall, he chooses to not know the wall so he can perceive what is on the other side. Due to the persistence of postulates of the universe the not know postulate degenerates into an attempt to vanish the unwanted effect by force, then, failing that, to hide the effect from oneself behind a screen usually of blackness. Now that we've covered the four basic postulates in more detail, let's cover the subject of pan-determined postulates further. In Dennis's book, which I will continue to quote, he gives this example. How many people can resist a stray cat who wanders in and looks at you with his big, pleading eyes? You don't know it, but that sudden urge to get him a saucer of milk and a nice warm home is more his pan-determined postulate than your self-determined one. Animals, being entirely natural and not being educated to the contrary, use their pan-determined postulates to the fullest, thus making willing slaves out of us oh so much more intelligent and rational humans. Babies too are masters of the pan-determined postulate, they have yet to be educated out of their belief in the efficacy of such things. In our civilization it has become an almost totally neglected aspect of life. What is called a magnetic personality is entirely the conscious or unconscious use of pan-determined postulates. The subject of pan-determined postulates is the whole subject of action at a distance. Learn to use them, for they are an integral part of the abilities at your disposal. Man, the materialist is endlessly mystified and intrigued by psionic abilities, which means relating to or denoting the practical use of psychic powers or paranormal phenomena, where beings know or create effects across a distance or through time. These are usually, in this day and age, manifestations of pan-determined postulates that are as much a surprise to their originators as they are to those learned scientists who examine them. The subject of knowing is the one most intimate to life, as everything about life itself involves this subject in one way or another. But in this universe, there are limitations on knowing. You can only know that which is brought into existence to be known. When the being knows things that aren't brought into existence as such, he is no longer operating in this universe. Therefore, to remain in this universe, and to continue to play its games, the being agrees that it will not know something until it's been brought into existence to be known. This is the basic law that governs this universe. And for any universe or game to exist at all, there has to be some sort of limitation on knowing. If you knew everything, there would be no universe, and there would be no game. Consider this for a moment. Would you bother playing chess if you knew every move your opponent was going to make? Would there be any progression through time if you knew everything, past, present, and future? Would there be anything such as discovery, surprise, or even learning? Would you even bother creating anything if you already knew the creation, and everyone else did too? No. There would be no game, and there would be no universe to play one in without a limitation on knowing. Knowing all would be a dull, static affair indeed. When we say something is important, it's a result of an enforcement to know it. Such enforcement results in conviction. A conviction, by definition, is a strongly held opinion or belief. If you are convinced of something, then it's your conviction. The more intensely a postulate is made, the more convincing it becomes. It increases in importance. It becomes significant. As one's purposes or postulates meet opposition, those purposes remain suspended in the mind. Remember, a purpose fulfilled is a purpose no longer. But if you are prevented from achieving that purpose, you are stuck with it. You now have a problem. You now have a game. To resolve such, you'll need to address that purpose as well as the opposition to it or the problem or game will persist. 
Now we have games and we have problems to make life fun and interesting. But the more games we play, and the more problems we have, the less effective our postulates are and thus the less effective we are as spiritual beings. But in order to have a game and have fun playing, you voluntarily lessen your abilities to levels comparable to your opponent. It's no fun to always win. But lessening yourself invites loss. Therefore, all games result in eventual failure. You take on your opponent's convictions, and your own postulates fail. In voluntary games, we use the terms win or lose. But in compulsive games, we use the terms overt and motivator. Overwhelm the other and you've committed an overt. Your opponent receives a motivator. In other words, to win in a compulsive game you overwhelm the other with an overt, but if you lose, you are overwhelmed and receive a motivator. Games are played in space and need time for their completion. In the absence of games, space and time cease to exist. Thus, conflicting postulates perpetuate space and time, while complementary postulates vanish it. A game, to be worth playing, must contain elements considered valuable. Value is monitored by the consideration of beauty, and is increased by scarcity. But as both the effect and the consideration of value or beauty are generated by life, then life has a senior value to all things. Complementary postulates enhance life, conflicting postulates detract from it. Thus, games, although considered fun, have the liability of lessening the amount of life the being possesses. As complementary postulates can dissolve games, we can see now that there is indeed a way out of this mess for the spiritual being. Thanks for listening today. If you haven't already started your TROM exercises, please watch the video on our channel on how to do level 1 TROM now. While TROM theory is fascinating, the exercises are more important by far. And it only takes a minimal understanding of TROM theory to perform levels 1 through 3, even less than I've given you on my lectures so far. My next talk will be on the next chapter of the book. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss any of these, as I intend to record many more. I'm Alison Tandry. We are DIY Salvation. Don't just use your mind. Resolve it.